Listen only mode. Hello everyone. Welcome to another webinar sponsored by ExpoSoft. Today we have um, tester and developer working together agile style with um, Dean Ann Harrison and Jonathan Spurgeon. Um, Sorry, I was going to change the... Okay. <laughs> Uh, just a little history. Uh, this webinar is hosted by ExpoSoft. We were founded in 2006. We are a company dedicated to software quality, and we provide this with software QA consulting and testing services. We have offices in San Francisco, Beijing, Oslo, and Amsterdam. Um, you can learn more about us at www.exposoft.com. Next, um, I'm Amy. And Jan, unfortunately, could not be with us today. He's over in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, just briefly, we have another uh, webinar coming up on 1217, Are Bad Metrics Worse Than No Metrics At All? Um, you can find more information about that at our Twitter page, at XBOSoft. Um, then we're just going to go over a little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone except the speakers will be muted. You can feel free to type questions in the chat box, and I will be in charge of those. If we have time to fit them in during the webinar, we will do so. If not, we'll, um, we'll do a general Q&A at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time for that, we'll uh, follow up with Jean Ann and Jonathan um, offline, and then we'll post those on, the blog, on our blog or um, get those questions out to you. Um, you'll also receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, which we put on YouTube and SlideShare. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Jonathan and Jean Ann, and they'll tell you a little about a little bit about themselves. Thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Jean Ann. <laughs> obviously, um, I just wanted to let you all know that Jonathan and I work together at a company called CardioNet, and um, we found a very uh, really good working relationship that we wanted to share our story to say, hey, guess what? Um, working in a regulated environment and working on a mobile medical device can actually be in an agile type work work environment. So um, anyway, I've been doing I've been speaking for many years uh, at conferences, been writing articles. Uh, if you have any um, question on that, check my LinkedIn profile. That's a good way to get in touch with me. And Jonathan, how about you? Oh, yeah. I, um, Jean Ann and I met uh, several years ago, at, uh, as she mentioned, CardioNet. We uh, hit it off right away. Uh, she was really interested in the topic matter, which uh, I have a big interest in QA as well, um, but I'm primarily a software developer. And then uh, working with Jean Ann, I really uh, developed much more of an appreciation for the challenges that QA, the QA team has. So it was a big uh, learning experience. So, OK, good. so we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to talk about some real stories that Jonathan and I had shared. And hopefully you can learn from them, gain some inspiration and uh, forge new relationships with uh, development teams and testing teams. And uh, please share so that we can learn as well. And uh, just to quickly go over this really fast, um, this is today's agenda. One of the things that I do want to mention is that I do not read slides. I go ahead and I talk. And I figure you're going to get the presentation anyway, so please be prepared that I'm not going to sit there and read the slide. Um, and listen to the stories. You don't have to take notes because you'll get the webinar sent to you. OK, forging ahead. Um, one of the things that I believe is really important, and I think Jonathan does too, is you've got to set your goals. And you've got to set them early on in a relationship as well as a project. So Jonathan. Um, <laughs> One of the things you and I did was we both checked our egos at the door, I think, when the two of us met. And we immediately struck a chord with each other in quoting Monty Python um, many times. <laughs> yeah, I think I was sort of the 
instigator of that. But yes. um, <laughs> yeah, I found that humor is a good way to relax, and when you're relaxed, you can uh, still do your best work. So, anyhow, back to you. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. It's, um, it, it's something that I found it put me at ease right away. But not only did it with Jonathan, I found it worked really well with other team members, whether it was development or not. And, um, you know, with, with Jonathan and I, the Monty Python is, is just something that really, it, it made us giggle. And um, one of the things I do want to point out, too, is you'll see on these slides, on the, well, they're all over the place on these slides, but they're little audio clips. I did originally have them. But I found that they don't really work uh, on the go-to meeting. Or at least I didn't find a way to do it. I didn't take enough time to do it. So when you do get this recording, please feel free to listen to them because I think they're quite silly and fun. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, Jonathan would do when I came over, you know, it's, it's awful when, a, when a, I think when a tester interrupts a developer. Um, was, you know, I'd cringe at the thought, oh gosh, I'm, I'm interrupting him again. And, you know, he would look up and he would just make a crack, make, make a crack. How, what usually did you say, Jonathan? Oh, do you like, remember? Um, she's making it up as she goes along. That was a, um, <laughs> one of the scenes from uh, Monty Python. <laughs> that happened to me all the time. And I would be like, yeah. no, I'm not making that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, at first you you kind of like um, took me seriously, but I think very yes. shortly. Um, and after working together, you saw that you know I was just having fun and joking, which uh, right. sort of as Jean Ann uh, mentioned before, put us into sort of a relaxed, happy mood, which you know we quickly realized, or I mean I think we already knew that uh, a good way to work when you're sort of happy and relaxed. We found that yes. for the, and also for the rest of the team as well. And uh, a number of people on our team actually, um, or the development team, I'll let Jean Ann speak for QA, but said it was you know, one of the, probably the best team which, with which they've ever worked. So um, Yeah, total anyhow. agreement. Yeah. It, was, it was such a pleasure to work with all the team members. Um, and hopefully I have some, we have some here online today, I'm not sure. But, I mean, this, we're talking, this, this team was several years ago. But uh, we all learned so much from each other. And one of the reasons why is because we, we didn't regard each other as enemies. We, we listened to one another. Um, we, we kept open to ideas. I, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, Keep an open mind. I'm sorry. Keep, uh, keep your eyes and ears and mind open, because you never know when inspiration will strike. And it's really true. You just never know. And I mean, I get inspiration from everywhere, from everything. I can look outside and look at the moon and go, "Ooh, I just thought I could apply that to that test." I mean, why I think this way, I don't know. But working with the team members. Um, I find if you show them immediate listening power, you're, you're empowering them. And I think that's a really important point, um, you know, and whether it's developer to tester or tester to developer. And so what, one of the things that uh, I really want testers to understand is please spend the time learning design concepts and programming concepts. I, I say this often in webinars and conferences, is that if, um, if, if uh, testers do not take the time to learn about these concepts, then you end up not really understanding where the developer is coming from. Um, Jonathan, you know, you want to yeah. talk about that part? Oh yeah, sort of the flip side of the coin, um, and developers should really uh, Learn about QA, you know, the challenges which uh, QA faces. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously the developers will create the system, and how it works, what's in there is probably relatively clear in their mind and, uh, and what it does. But um, 
from the perspective of QA, it's a big mystery. It's a big black box, and it makes it um, difficult. And just somehow they magically know how to test it. You know, that's not going to happen. So, right. especially if you have poor or non-existent requirements. So, really, um, spending a lot of time on requirements is. Uh, um, immensely important. And then, you know, it goes from there. Um, Jean Ann, I think she mentioned uh, learning the architecture and some of the uh, design right. and the detail. Well, I think way do a better job. I think with, um, with mobile in particular, you really need to, to spend the time to learn what's already there. Um, because one of the problems is, is that requirements are not flushed out. There's a lot of unknowns in mobile. We don't know how the battery will charge and how it affects the software if we've never tested it before. And developers certainly don't realize that, oh, I have to um, make sure that I design my software to behave a certain way based on how the battery charges. Uh, I think, you know, Jonathan and I certainly came across that with um, how hot the the device got. Remember that your device is small and it's contained. So the heat does not dissipate as quickly as it might with, say, um, you know, a bigger, uh, bigger device like a laptop. And because of that, yeah, laptops get hot, sure, but phones get hotter and tablets get hot and, you know, other proprietary devices get hot. And because of that, um, it it does affect the software, and so one of the one of the real stories that came out of all this when we just, we found the temperature reaching, and I'll try to translate this, Jonathan. Maybe you can correct me on this, but um, one of the things we found with our medical device was that the temperature of the device, it when the software was engaged, of course your um, your your CPU speeds up. And, and when it does that and you're charging, now, of course, you're dealing with more heat being generated. So when the heat generates and you end up trying to communicate uh, wirelessly to another entity, like a web server, for example, what will happen is that, um, you know, you could damage your cell modem. So des developers can design software to go ahead and, regu not regulate it, but to be aware that, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to check my temperature of the device. And in the meantime, I can shut it off when it reaches a certain temperature. And in our case, what we found was that uh, before damage hit, damage was about 75 degrees Celsius. I think that's, what, about 130, Jonathan, Fahrenheit, 130 degrees, something like that? Hot, hot, whatever. It's hot, it yeah. yeah. And and so <laughs> <laughs> so what we ended up finding was, okay, well, let's put it at 60 degrees is when we stop sending uh, messages out, outside of the device. So right there, the, mo the cell modem, we would tell the cell modem to shut down. So now you're engaging, and just this is, this is a, a shtick with me about um, mobile testers. Please be aware. This is an entire system. That means you are using and utilizing your hardware, your firmware or operating system, and the software. All of that has to be considered. If you're not doing that in your testing, if you're not considering those interdependencies, then you're not doing justice to your testing. Okay, so please think about these things. Um, I think I'm going to change the screen so we can move on. <laughs> Terminology. Um, I hate hearing the words breaking the software, attacking, um, fails. Uh, I can't tell, Jonathan, have I, did I ever come to you and say, oh, it's failing, it's failing? <laughs> oh, Probably gosh. it doesn't work. Um, yeah, I, I honestly can't really remember. But, um, right. Yeah. I don't, there, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, there are probably at times less than uh, fully diplomatic words, but my um, uh, paradigm survived in spite of it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is where polite can come in. I'm, I'm sorry, not polite, because I'm reading it. Um, this is where humor can come in, you know, where you can utilize your humor 
to diffuse a not so great situation. Um, you know, oh, it doesn't work. Okay, you know, maybe, you know, using some sort of humor to combat the negativity. Uh, keep negative wording and negative attitudes out, out of the equation. Just get rid of it because it's so difficult. And what testers have to remember is developers work really, really hard at what they do. And they have to stay focused, singularly focused, on what they're doing. And because of that, testers have to be aware of when to approach them. And, and then, of course, the how. So what we're trying to, to say today, you know, with Jonathan and I, we, it was easy for us because we did put each other in such high regard. And we used the humor to, to get what we needed to get across, but also to simply um, just, just find that we ended up working together a lot more often than we thought we would. This was not yeah. a situation where he and I did things on our own. No, and also I'd like to interject here. We at uh, Cardone were blessed with a brilliant CEO. I mean, really, um, in many ways, he's a, a genius. And he, um, one of the things I picked up from him and used it sort of half seriously was, um, you know, the focus on increasing shareholder value and sort of translating. Um, that's a way of saying, like, okay, don't worry about your egos. Like, we have a mission here. And whatever is best for the shareholders or stakeholders um, is the route you should take instead of, you know, defending your own opinion. So if someone else has a better opinion, um, which would be, you know, help increase shareholder value more, well, that's obviously the way to take. Yeah, take it. And also, he mm -hmm. emphasized the, I think it's mentioned in a later slide, but he emphasized mm -hmm. the importance of communication with each yeah. other. Um, he said it's better to over-communicate than under-communicate. And I've worked in some um, uh, companies in the past where their philosophy was to isolate people in cubicles, try to not get them to communicate with each right. other. And um, yeah, that's really, I think, a, a not Well, we a, had an open space plan. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. We, we had our own little desk area, but it was fairly open. And of course, the lab was, was open. And there were many times where just the two of us would sit there and we'd be pounding out the requirements. I mean, we'd sit there and play and we'd review the code and oh, let's try this and see if this works. And while we're, you know, you had one computer where you you had the code up. And there were oftentimes we'd be looking at, you know, okay, this was, we're doing this, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, and let's try it over here. Let's see if this sequence works. And, you know, there were times we had to get to that level because one of the problems in bug reports, I, I'm sorry, not bug reports, in finding bugs in mobile is that, uh, they're oftentimes intermittent, and they're oftentimes very hidden. Hidden. Ooh, that's a hard word to say. Um, meaning that they're not easily in your face open. Um, one of the problems that I had, speaking of communication <laughs> and isolation, was, and I tell this story often if you've heard me speak at a conference, but um, this was a learning lesson on my part that I will never forget. And um, what it was was now keeping in mind this medical device has like six different software applications all working together to communicate out to the world medical data for the physician to diagnose a patient's heart, well, or heart issues. So uh, there's this one software application that installed the operating system and the GUI for the patient to use. And this, this uh, configuration software and it was on the laptop. And we had a, an exception error that appeared. Well, OK, I'm going to write up my book report. And I did. And I assigned it to the developer, not Jonathan, uh, but I assigned it to another developer who was in charge of working on that particular application. And two days later, he comes back to me and he says, this isn't my bug. This is operating system bug. 
and I felt horrible. If I had spent the time and did a little bit more testing, and when I say a little bit, we're talking a half an hour, um, you know, not days. If I had spent just a little bit more time, I could have, even if I had sat with them and talked to them and said, hey, I have this bug here, what do you think about it? Um, then guess what? I wouldn't have wasted one developer's time for two days. That is something that is a strong lesson to pass on to people. <laughs> Please do not do that. Um, spend the time a little bit isolating whatever you can. Be, and it's why Jonathan and I sat and read code many times, because we had to figure out where in the software the problem lied. So, um, and Jonathan, you and I, we, we were the ones really that knew the architecture of that entire system rather than just, you know, the, the separate pieces. I mean, we had to, it, to be able to do our jobs. Indeed. Okay, so um, one of the things I wanted to point out is, um, you know, when you're working with a developer, uh, set an appointment, go ahead and set, send an email and say, hey, I realize you're really busy, um, can we set some time aside later today or tomorrow, uh, or I really need for you to look at this, how quickly can we, can we talk, uh, how, can we spend some time in the lab together, set that appointment. Because I think, again, it comes down to whether or not you even um, can have the time with that developer. I, I truly try to respect their time. And uh, Jonathan and I used to spend quite a bit of time, but we, we would find time where, you know what? Jonathan would say to me, well, one of the famous lines, I think is coming up in a slide, but Jonathan, you want to say every time you saw me coming over, what would you say to me when you, uh, said, when you knew it was, I was coming over for a bug? Oh um, gosh, I said all kinds of things. It was probably just lines from Monty Python. You know, of course, you mentioned previously making it up as she goes along, and, and there's probably right. some less. I, I think maybe some less repeatable uh, lines, which wouldn't be appropriate in sort of a public forum to say. I mean, Monty Python, it was all in the Well, this was, this was something that was easy to blame. Remember, you, you blame, oh, it's the hardware. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really and again, quickly, we have a, I'm sorry, Tina. We have a question ahead. from Patricia. She was wondering if you were both employee coworkers on the project or did Jean Ann come in and join the project as a consultant from, a, from another organization? I came yeah. in, we were both employees. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so anyway, the, the thing that Jonathan had said to me oftentimes was, it's the hardware. And I, I can't tell you how many times I cringed. And I hate hearing that, that phrase. But to be fair to Jonathan, Jonathan, you tell you you talk about wh why you were doing that. Well, I have a terrible confession, Jean Ann. I I think I just uh, said that to you know get you riled up. You know, Which was a good way to do but, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, on the other half, it was we were also simultaneously perfecting the hardware. It wasn't mm -hmm. a off the shelf sort of like a PC, and yeah. um, and you know. It, takes a while to, um, and you know, often it was hardware issues as well, so. Well, uh, I think a lot of times is that we go back to the, to the wasted two days lesson in that, oh, Gina, why don't you spend a little bit more time doing some more testing and learn from this? Don't just rush over to the developer and say, oh, it's a bug, it's a bug. Um, you know, it's, it, there are times where, yes, it is the hardware. And, you know, then what comes down to is, well, maybe we need to spend a little bit more time together testing to see what really is happening. So, but this was just one of those things. Again, it was humor, and it was humor in a weird way. Um, and Jonathan and I definitely have a weird sense of humor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I knew what he was doing. I knew he was doing it to me to to get me all riled up. And there were times that I couldn't help myself. I'm like, oh, you know, but, but yet, you know, there were many times that I laughed because I, I knew that he would say that. So it, 
you just have to, again, establish that rapport, but um, also remember to set your goals of collaboration, um, set the times, Make sure you, you plan out your tests. One of, the, one of the things that I found was really helpful was talking to Jonathan and planning out my tests based on some of the things I learned from him. And that is something that I think development would like to get a little bit more involved with, not to the point where they're doing the testing, not to the point where they're writing documentation, because as we know, development doesn't love documentation. but um, with Jonathan being the exception. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe spend, spend some time, spend, spend an afternoon or spend a couple of hours, um, you know, talking to a lead developer or the architect and maybe, you know, seeing, hmm, what kinds of tests should we be doing? What areas of the software should we be covering with more detail? Um, yeah. You know, I think that's something Jonathan and I certainly spent time doing. Yeah, I'd um, like to point out, you know, obviously it works both ways. Uh, developers can learn a lot, um, you know, how to test, you know, really um, to make uh, QA's life easier. And yes. it will um, uh, improve the design. It's good to get QA involved in development of the project as early as possible and so you yes. can design for testability. Um, you know, because often, uh, I don't know, people or at least I talk about how, um, you know, some developers see QA as sort of an afterthought. You know, they um, create this sort of blob, you know, they toss it over the fence into the QA, uh, um, over to QA, and then QA has to sort of figure out how to test it. But um, that's I think it's much more efficient if, um, as I said, you know, QA involved, um, you know, at the very beginning. That's, you know, how right. are we going to test this system and develop it, you know, right. for flexibility. So, and it will, you know, um, improve the design, obviously. Yeah. Right. More, more than just testability. So. Well, again, it's the understanding, right, from different perspectives. You know, the development perspective and the tester perspective of what the software should be doing and how it should behave. And especially considering what you said earlier, Jonathan, about, you know, considering uh, increasing shareholder value. One of the biggest mm -hmm. ways to do that is to really keep in mind user experience. Now, user experience I consider as an umbrella of usability testing, trainability testing. If anybody heard uh, my webinar back in September with uh, Dr. Philip Liu on uh, user usability, te I'm sorry, us user experience testing. And, um, you know, it, it's really important for testers and developers to understand this is our common goal. And Jonathan and I understood that from the very beginning, that this is what we want to do. We want the user, or in our case, the patient, to have really seamless experience and not to have to worry about, oh, you know, the, the device is going to blow up because it gets too hot. <laughs> you know, things like that. Or, okay, that's an exaggeration, but that the cell modem stops working because it gets too hot and therefore there's no data getting to the doctor. That's pretty serious. I mean, you know, if, if that person is, is um, getting this device, they're obviously having some heart issues that need to be looked at. So we, the two of us took that very seriously, and we also kept considering this in how we work together. So moving onward, and of course we've talked a lot about the collaboration. Um, Jonathan, you like the idea of appointing one contact person on the team, and oh. why don't you talk about that? Yeah, no, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be one person, um, right. but I think the you know, um, development team should really expect and plan um, to spend a significant amount of time with the QA team. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for overall system efficiency, if you um, sort of try to prevent communication um, yeah. between development and QA, you're just 
slowing down the, um, the whole development process. Cause often that is so I'd, true. Yeah, because <laughs> often I, I found I was discussing with one uh, person at, um, you know, uh, when we worked together, one of, mm -hmm. you know, other person, a manager, that, you know, I explained that um, QA, when they're testing, they just don't come over just to, you know, gratuitously waste time. They have a problem. You know, they need um, sort of, they need answers, like explanations. So, mm -hmm. um, and if you just try to ignore them, they're just stuck, you know, spinning their wheels. And, you know, they're not going to yeah. get work done. So you need to um, plan, um, you know, expect that and plan, yeah. you know, uh, to... Uh, you know, help them along, explain um, you know, the system, um, maybe some of the requirements aren't fully clear, take time to spend those, and which of course is why it's very important to have good requirements. You'll ultimately save time in the long run. Um, right. And you know, just maybe just for um, inefficiency, you know, it may be right. more efficient just to have one point person where the QA team can run over and ask them questions. And of course, that person is not going to be able to spend 100% concentrated time on development. But right. That's just, um, that's just well, the that's that's a really good point in the in the sense that development is not a lone island. Um, you know, they, they don't go into their their offices or cubicles or whatever and just shut themselves out anymore. It's it's not how things can get done and get done efficiently. The um, early on in my career, I um, I learned a very important lesson about you know testability of requirements, and if I had a development team that was willing to listen, unfortunately they weren't because they were under the gun, and they had to get the, the stuff out the door. Uh, what ended up happening was. For the first time, and I'm not joking, for the first time in four years, because this is the fourth year of this particular company that I was at, for the first time in four years, the company was late in delivering um, a release. And it was such a shock to everybody that, you know, that it was late. But it could have been prevented because I did spot it, I spot the problem in a requirement that was not testable or it was too broad and it should have been very concise and clear but you know that kind of thing does happen and if you sit down with development and work out those requirements and work out the testability prior to releasing the builds or releasing uh, to the point of user acceptance testing you'll find that it does become more efficient and beat that competition to, to releasing those apps. Um, you know, that's one of the things I think we, both Jonathan and I, are completely on board with, with requirements. But again, with mobile in particular, it's very difficult because there isn't a lot of information prior to releasing or prior to, um, you know, even to the point of builds. I did a lot of exploratory testing to figure out benchmarks, and then we went from there. And that, again, because I figured out those benchmarks, then I did have to spend the time with Jonathan and his team. So you do want to try and spend that time and work with each other and give, give development information. Let them know what's going on. They don't know. So... Um, and, and you know what? I strongly believe this. I have always believed this. Let's make the development team look brilliant, really. <laughs> because it's not, the more they look brilliant, the more we do. And mm -hmm. we may not get the kudos directly. But in the end, you know what? It does come back. It does. Um, yeah. I think, and, and it comes back as a team. Because the more Jonathan got the kudos, I also felt I got kudos. Yeah, well, the... Um development team, we took the philosophy that QA um, was there to, um, she said, you know, make us look brilliant and then, um, you know, and then to avoid the humiliation and embarrassment of uh, 
right. um, keeping a product where the customers are discovering bugs. So, right. you know, our the whole development team realized that very well, and then yeah. that's why we had such a good, uh, you know, philosophy for our cooperation. And then also, uh, I'd like to, you know, expound uh, on the point that um, what Jean a minute or two ago was discussing about requirements. I have found QA very useful when developing requirements because uh, developers sort of think a little bit differently, yes, and uh, I've had many times, yeah, I've had many times where uh, testers say, <laughs> well, this isn't clear, how are you going to test it, or, and I found them very, very helpful, and um, anyhow, so, yeah, well, uh, it could make uh, requirements a, a team effort, so to speak, or a multi-team effort. I get I get told all the time, oh my God, you're so picky. You're so picky. And it's I want to make things as clear as possible. You know, there were many times I said to you, and I remember this because I say it all the time to people, what do you mean by it? What do you mean by that? Because those types of words can make things very confusing. And one of the biggest problems that we as humans, we tend to, oh, you figure out what I'm saying. Well, that's also a great way to have misunderstandings. And so you want to be very, very clear, no matter who you're talking to. But in particular, when testers and developers get to talking to one another. And I always would say, and I do say it a lot, I'm sorry for being pedantic. I'm sorry for being picky, because I know I am. And there's a reason. It's to avoid, and that's what testers do. We're trying to prevent bad things from happening. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember, to, you know, even to this day, I remember very <laughs> clearly how Gene Ann was very uh, picky, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, no, it, it's good. It's uh, yeah. very necessary. And, uh, you know, to this day, you know, some of my, um, you know, people with my uh, present position, they, uh, requirements, and I think, you know, I think back to Gene and I tried to make them very precise and clear, and <laughs> sure enough, QA people, they'll say, well, this isn't very clear, they offer um, suggestions for improvement, so. It's, and, uh, you know, yeah. and that's a and reminder, now, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want, I want to make this point very clear, um, that it's, it's a huge reminder to testers, remember, you do not think like developers, and developers do not think like testers. Okay, that's that's really important when it comes to this kind of a relationship. Remember to keep your ego at the door, type of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for interrupting, Jonathan. I just had to say that. Oh no, no, that's okay. I pretty much said everything I. Uh, okay. I need to say, so. Well, again, it's better to over communicate than under communicate, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so this is this is the slide that I like. It's the hardware. No, it's not. <laughs> um, one of the things that we do as testers, we do jump quickly uh, when it comes to bugs. And um, I, what what I wanted to share with you is a story that Jonathan and I, a particular bug that we found. And let me just briefly explain the problem. What happened with the monitors, the heart monitors, was that they, there were many coming back to the company that were, um, uh, that they just wouldn't work anymore. They stopped working. And the only way to fix them is to get a brand new operating system, brand new software. It was that bad. And, you know, of course, immediately the patient would get a new, immediately a new monitor and, and uh, you know, new device. But in the meantime, we were thinking, my gosh, what was going on? So I decided one time to just do a lot of stress testing and found that all of a sudden the monitor would stop working. And I brought it over to Jonathan, and Jonathan's line was, it's the hardware. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so what I did was I said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do some more testing. And I kept working the stress testing and kept working it, kept working it, trying to figure out, watching my log files and, and saying, geez, why does it stop at a certain level? 
And then I, I finally was like, you know what, Jonathan, this is happening. Let's sit down and go over this and see what's going on. And this took a lot of time because this type of stress testing, you know, in an hour, you, you were creating a lot of data. And, um, and Jonathan, what did you say to me? Do you remember when we found out that um, the, the message bin was, was too full? Do you remember what you said? Oh, it um, never happened? <laughs> you, oh, you... Uh, yeah, actually, honestly, I, uh, I don't recall. OK. Well, what, what, what happened was that um, I have a weird memory, just in case anybody wonders. Um, I, I tend to remember things pretty well. But anyway, one of the things that we, we found was that Oh, this is a stress test. This would never happen in real life. No, no human being is going to send that many messages back and forth. So, um, so what happened was that I went to our scientists and I said, well, what would designate a typical high flyer, which is a person that created a lot of messages going back and forth? And, and when I say back and forth, uh, the data being generated was creating a lot of messages coming from one end and then trying to ship out to another end. And so they had, we had this message bin that was sitting in the middle, basically, in the monitor itself. And this bin had a limit. But none of us thought that it was possible that it would reach the limit. We didn't think of it right away. And, you know, Jonathan would spend hours trying to figure it out. I would spend hours trying to figure it out. And then, you know, it comes to the conclusion, oh, it'll never happen. Well, what we found was that um, this, the scientist said to us, oh, well, the, the average high flyer would generate 174 events. Well, events, double that, and you got messages. And that was the problem. It would hit the 200 mark, and then it was, sh it shut down the monitor. And the monitor was just, it couldn't ha handle it. Yeah, so, I think in the originally, I should point out in the original requirements, I think it was um, specified the limit. You know, it, it shall hold. You know, I think it was like two hundred events or something. But um, was it events yeah. or messages? Remember, because we um, had that discussion. Yeah, I, I actually don't remember, but I remember it was before. You know, we developed it. We covered it in the requirements, but then mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, yep. Reality was different, uh, different right. than the uh, theoretical envision. Exactly, of, uh, and this is a prime example of again theoretical versus reality. This is what you end up finding with mobile, it, more so than in other applications. Yes, you do. You you have more information available to you in desktop and web applications, but in mobile, we're still discovering these things. We're discovering these limits. And remember, too, not only do you have a small contained space physically, which does contain heat, but also you've got limited storage space for data. And that can really create a problem when you have large amounts of data being transmitted or trying to transmit or trying to even be processed. And that's what was happening with this particular problem was the fact that we could we, we shut down the monitor because we reached the limit and we didn't realize how we did it. So yeah. um, we spent a lot of time in the lab, I remember, just going over and trying to recreate this problem. And once we create, recreate it, you were the one, Jonathan, I remember this clearly, you were the one that figured out that it was hitting the message bid and limit. And it was well, like, oh, right. hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the things which um, would be good, I remember another that um, one of the GNAN's team members, QA team members, he was also a, uh, you know, superb uh, tester. He, um, one of the things that stuck in my mind, he'd always say, which um, is probably a, uh, you know, a QA type of mentality is, well, what if, and he, his philosophy was, um, well, what if it goes over the limit, or what if, you know, how to handle different cases. So, mm -hmm. um, and then you know you could feed that back in, into the requirements. So instead of just setting, well, 
you know, the bin shuffle 200 uh, messages or something that, you know, uh, sort of um, expand the requirement to, you know, explain how to handle if it exceeds the limit. Well, I think um, that's why we made the distinction between messages and events. Was that yeah. events were, you know, that's probably, again, the requirement was not clear and yeah. because of a lack of, of understanding. And so once we realized yeah. what was going on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyhow, it goes back to, you know, the, um, you know, how writing very thorough requirements, you know, really saves you a lot of time in the, uh, the long run. Right. And it's very interesting. I sort of wanted to mention there's, um, I don't know if um, all the people listening have heard of uh, Steve McConnell. He's fairly well known in the um, software engineering world. And he wrote a book called Software Estimation. And he, in there, he mentions a, um, you know, a method for, um, you know, doing software estimation. You know, it's the uh, what was it, uh, Kokomo two, I think. Um, anyhow, in there, it's all oh, look it up. You know, Google it. But anyhow, he talks about you know in this uh, what was it, Kokomo two um, sort of software estimation method. You know, they talk about um, factors. You know that affect how long it takes to develop software. Well, the, the first factor, you know, is most significant is uh, software complexity, but very uh, mm. close on, close behind is actually the um, requirements analysis uh, um, analyst capability. So really, um, it has like, the quality of requirements has a huge impact on you know, the effort it takes to develop a, a software system. And yeah. um, and to give you an example, um, I'm looking at page 67, you know, in this book. Um, I think it's, what is it? Uh, I don't know what edition it is. And now, then the third factor after the quality of requirements is the programmer capability. So anyhow, according to, um, you know, uh, the Kokomo, uh, I can't remember if it's Kokomo or Kokomo. Yeah, Kokomo to, you know, factors. Really, quality of the requirements is more important than programmer capability, you know, if one can believe that. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, enough said. Well, no, I mean, you, you quoted me uh, a lot of times about Steve McConnell. And one of the yeah. things that I, I find helpful is, again, to think about other ways to try and figure out your own path. There's no one way, there's no one magic bullet to apply, especially to mobile, but definitely across the board in software. Uh, and I think that's one of the things some testers and certainly managers get too curious, too involved with one way, the best way. There is no best way. There's whatever way it works. Right? I mean, you and I, we certainly, we tried lots of different things and yeah. didn't always work. You know, something that might have been, might have worked for Steve McConnell, for example, um, yeah. didn't always work for us. But yet, you know, we found a way. Again, you still can find inspiration. Just yeah. keep looking. And also, um, Jean Ann and I. Give me a quick um, time check. It's about oh, 10 yeah. of um, 2 right okay. now. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Okay. No, we, this is what happens to Jonathan and I. We, when our phone conversations, we just go on and on and on. <laughs> um, yeah. I just I, let, let's let's move on to the next slide so we can get at least the concepts out. Um, yeah. You know what, testers? Please, 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 please spend the time to learn the architecture. I can't stress this enough. Sit down, ask to be involved in code reviews, learn code. Even ask a developer, hey, you know what, can, can you show me this? And you know, a lot of times they're willing to help out. And, and you know what, they appreciate it. Oh, gee, you want to learn what I do? Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that testers don't always take the time. Stop checking. You know, stop saying, oh, okay, requirement does this. Okay, check, I did that test. Stop doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and, say, and call it a day. That's the thing. 
you, you still have to test your requirements, of course. But, um, but make sure that you think about other ideas. Um, Jonathan mentioned one of my team members used to ask questions, what if? What if is really important? What if I try this? In mobile, it is so important. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, you know, the, I used to do that a lot. I used to spend a lot of time, again, exploring and trying to figure out what if I go ahead and, um, you know, charge my battery from a dead battery and then go ahead and watch the temperature and how long does it take to go from zero degrees up to a higher level, like say 80%. And what is the software doing? What if I have the software do this? What if I don't install the software? Does, it ha does the temperature heat up as quickly? Yeah, it, you know, some people argue, oh, well, it's, it, you know, that's hardware testing or that's operating system testing. Um, yeah, but it gives you a better understanding of how the system works. Uh, you know, that's really important. You really do need to understand. And I'm going to go ahead and skip a little bit of this because I want to talk about log files. Again, Jonathan and I spend a lot of time reading log files. Thank you, Jonathan, for giving me Paraterm, which is basically um, one of the things I used often. I used this, this tool, this serial port tool, serial port to USB. Um, and one of the things that it helped me with is understanding what happens when. That is so important. You're sitting there and you're you're working on functional steps, right? You're going, okay button, and oh, I'm going to press that button, I'm going to press that button, and while you're doing that, you can actually see what's going on in your log file of, of what is being generated. And this tells you more about the code. And so what we found, and I highlighted on this particular one, an exception error, and this exception error it, this is not something I worked with Jonathan. This was actually from a different situation. But the point was, was this particular problem was intermittent. And it took me four days of testing because I kept trying to work with the developer. And unfortunately, that developer really didn't understand because he was working out of place. He was assigned to this part of the code that really wasn't his specialty. And because of that, we were all trying to work together. We were all trying to pitch in, and, uh, and so he was trying to help out, and he just didn't really understand. So I did have to spend more time on this problem. But the thing is, is you know, every time you get an exception error, you have a memory leak. If you don't turn off that device, guess what happens? Uh, you're going to run out of memory, and pretty fast. So um, Jonathan, you wanted to talk about the von Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle? Oh. Yeah, it's really just um, enabling logs when um, testing. Um, it can have an effect on the behavior of the machine. You know, the observation right. affects the uh, the result because if you release the, um, you know, when the customer is using the device, if you're not uh, logging, you know, events and things. You know, there could be different behavior. It's sort of like, you know, maybe as a developer you run applications in debug mode. Well, there's right. it's not unlikely that it'll behave differently in release right. mode. You know, so. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what cool. just really fast to reiterate what Jonathan said. When it comes to log files, I'm going to warn you because I was warned too. And that is turn off your logging or the high detailed logging and retest if you find a problem because lo detailed logging will affect performance. Be very, very careful. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, well, we talked a little bit about some of the bugs we found um, and reviewing the log files, replicating steps, working with each other. Uh, I guess, you know, you can read all this and, and I'm not joking, rinse and repeat. Keep doing it until you can isolate further the conditions. Um, and then today, just a real quick summary. You can read that. Uh, I would really prefer to get to questions. Do we have some time to uh, take some questions, Amy? Sure. 
Um, we have one question from Thomas, and he says, my test team is in the U.S. and our development team is in Germany. Do you have any tips to enhance the relationship? Jonathan, why don't you oh. go since we have a perfect story for this. Yeah, I was going to say learn to speak German. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I worked um, uh, for a while. I was living in Austria, and, you know, I'm, I'm able to speak German. But, uh, <laughs> no, I only spoke English with... Um, uh, Jean Ann. Yeah, I've um yeah, having distributed teams, um, just observing throughout my career, it's a big challenge and also goes along with outsourcing. Um, really going back to sort of um, my harangue about requirements, um, I think it's you know, a lot of people hate re writing requirements, but the more specific and detailed you can be the better. But I also should say if you're developing a product where you don't really quite know what the requirements are, sort of a pure, from what I understand, you know, a pure agile um, methodology is much yeah. better. Well, you just sort of each, each iteration, you, you know, write the requirements then. Uh, I should go back to the Steve McConnell Kokomo uh, 2 factor. Um, that data they extracted from the waterfall method, um, and uh, funny how sometimes you know you may not have uh, be have the right requirements at the beginning of a uh, right. you know a project. Um, but even if I'm um, kind of a believer, even if you maybe are developing it or making it up as you go along. You know, yeah. just trying to figure out what you want to build. It's still worth creating requirements because of posterity, and also the QA team will want. Oh, well, that's it. Yeah. yeah, you want to work together yeah. throughout, and that's one of the things that Jonathan wants to talk about. But I, I got to jump in here uh, because we don't have much time. But one of the things that I wanted to to talk about too was that when Jonathan was in Austria and I was in the U.S. Uh, we had to figure out timing because, of course, you're dealing with uh, quite a major time zone difference. And no, no, I was also, well, pardon me, Jonathan? I think it was, uh, when I was there, it was nine hours. Right, right. So it was a huge difference because I was in California at the time and uh, and he was in Austria. So that was that's a big difference. And mm -hmm. um, we figured out what would be the best time for the both of us and spent time working together on the phone and certainly a lot of email. Um, so it's, you know, it's something that you have to figure out what is the best time, but don't give up. Don't give up on, on not working with one another. It, it just means, you know, sometimes you've got to compromise with your timing. Yeah, going back to the, um, um, the person's uh, question, there's a lot of tools that I found very useful, like wikis, where you yeah. just have sort of casual notes about the project where um, people can share and you can all Great edit point. it themselves. We've had, we had very good success with that at Cardio yeah. Net and also, um, you know, my current uh, position. Um, then, of course, bug tracking tools, which I'm sure you use, mention requirements. Um, but really, yeah, um, yeah to sort of um, help the team in Germany, yeah, I, ought to, I would recommend spending a lot of time, um, you know, setting up, coming up with tools and wikis and bug trackers, yeah. you know, to make it uh, easy. And then, you know, you'll probably just have to stay up late at night or get up early yeah. in the morning and have Skype uh, <laughs> sessions. So, I, you know, I don't right. think there's any mag magic bullet. No. Again, it's a willing to collaborate, really. It's a commitment yeah. to that. Yeah. Was Amy about this? We have one more from John who says, how do you get the end user involved in oh. software testing? Interesting oh, okay. question. Um, one of the things that uh, I did, this is years ago, was I would go ahead and spend time with the end user and learn what they did. Now, this was a user. This wasn't a customer. 
Um, so it was someone within the company that I learned how she went about her day. And I always remembered that lesson and would try to apply to things like I didn't meet any patients that used the medical device. Um, so for me, it was trying to imagine, gee, if my grandmother was using the medical device and that temperature got too hot, well, the, my grandmother's skin is sensitive. It's more sensitive than mine, who, where I'm quite a bit younger than her. So you have to kind of put yourself in that place, I think. Um, talk to people. Ask. I do all the time. I don't, you know, I don't specifically have a, um, a, a, an application that I'm testing right now. So when it comes to mobile, I'll go ahead and I'll talk to people and say, how do you use that? As a matter of fact, there was, I was uh, in Miami for a conference and I, we all went out to dinner and the waitress came over with a, a proprietary device taking our orders. And I looked at it and of course I'm always going to be interested. And I was going, oh, how do you use that? And she was showing me how she used it. Not just how it's supposed to be used, but how she used it. And I learned just by watching that, oh, that's kind of interesting. Hmm, I wonder if. And the, the, then, then comes the questions in my mind, well, what if I did this? And what if I did that? So I think you can gain inspiration literally by just talking to people. Yeah. Also, I'd, I'd like to point out that um, you mentioned how to get the uh, end users involved. It's um, you know, often kind of difficult, expensive, time-consuming. Um, mm. So users, user feedback is, uh, in my view, very valuable. And it's even better if you can get them involved at the very beginning of the project yeah. before you actually create it. There's actually a very good book I read uh, number of years ago. It's called The Trouble with Computers by uh, Thomas Landauer. And the gist of the book was um, the trouble with computers was ease of usability. So his uh, um, sort of remedy was either have an expert interface designer design the interface, or using my terminology, use guinea pigs, and you come up with sort of a prototype um, mm -hmm. observe them, see how they use it, if it's easy or not, and then refine it and go through several iterations like that. Because I'm of the mind, anyone involved with product, uh, product within the company, they sort of get polluted, you know, so to speak, because everything is clear and obvious to them. And if a user can't use it, well, the user must be stupid, so, uh, which is obviously ridiculous. And that's why you need external feedback. So that's actually worth spending the time, you know, right. to uh, gather up some, you know, people to uh, comment on or, and actually be, you know, you take videos, take notes, et cetera. Um, just well, there's another, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just saying, depends how much effort you're uh, willing to put into it. But, you know, I'm sure, I know there are many cases of products where you release them and they fail because they're just difficult to use. The user mm -hmm. rejects them, and so it's uh, a worthwhile investment, you know, sort of, uh, you know, get uh, users to help, but, you know, from day one. Offer sort user of like testing sessions. Uh, you might want to have it, like, in a beta thing and offer user testing sessions. You know, we have weekend testing sessions uh, throughout yeah. the world with various um, groups of us, but there's also, you know, why not just do a user testing session for a couple of hours to gain more yeah. information of how a user uses it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I think that's it, Amy, for now. Um, we have about two, two or three more questions, but I think we should address it um, offline, and then we'll send yeah. it out because we're already sure. at five minutes over, and I think people yeah. might have yeah. to start logging off. But thank you very much for everyone for attending, yeah. and thank you, Jean Ann and Jonathan. And okay. um, we hope to see you again soon. Check us out, www.xbosoft.com. Thank you. Okay, there we go. All okay. right. Okay, thank you.